Welcome to another episode of the Lifestyle Architects. Today I'm very excited to have Tim Grawl on the show. He's the author of Your First Thousand Copies, the step-by-step -step guide to marketing your book. And he's also the founder of Outthink, where he works with authors such as Daniel Pink, Ramit Sethi, Chip and Dan Heath, Pamela Slim, and many others to help them build their platform, connect with readers, and sell more books. So that's a little intro. I read your book recently and it's really like to the point. So that's why I wanted to bring you on here as well, Tim. So welcome to the show. Oh, well, thanks for having me. I've been looking forward to it. Definitely. So why don't you tell us a bit about yourself and kind of how you got to work with so many amazing big name authors early on when you got started? Well, I had been, um, I had gone to school to be a programmer. So, you know, I'd gotten out and gotten a couple of different jobs and was just freelancing, you know, building websites and um, for people. And at the same time, I had started a blog network in the cycling industry and really started learning about like marketing and how to get people to pay attention to what you're doing. And so I was just kind of doing that for different clients and, you know, freelancing for different people. And then, about you know five and a half years ago, I started working with Ramit. He was the first author I ever worked with and helped on his book launch and then uh, really enjoyed the work and so I just started picking up um, other author clients and about four and a half years ago decided to just focus on that niche of helping authors and really, the way that I got so many big name clients it's always funny because I get asked this you know from on a regular basis, and I have to actually point you to somebody else. So uh, this guy named Charlie Hohen wrote this little ebook mm -hmm. called um, the, um, oh, what was it called? It was called The Recession Proof Graduate. Mm -hmm. And he actually just released it on Amazon as a book, like expanded it and um, put some more content in it. And it walks you through this really simple process of learning how to um, pitch doing a little bit of free work and then turning that into paying clients. And so that's what I did is I would I went to some of these big name authors. I would look at what they were doing and identify some things they could be doing better and I'd send them an email offering to do a little bit of work for free. And I said my only you know, the only thing I ask is at the end you'll look at a proposal to keep working together. And, you know, for Daniel Pink, you know, that was almost five years ago and we're still working together. And so um that's how I just kind of went out into the world and started building a name was just doing some work for all these different authors and not all of them hired me afterwards but if we did work together I could still list them as a client nobody had to know they didn't pay me you know I still worked for them and they're happy with the work and so it's a really good way to build up an early client base by just doing a little bit of free work helping them out and many of them turned into long-term clients some of them didn't but it allowed me to get my foot in the door in a lot of these places where normally you know they would if i had pitched them on just you know hiring me they probably all would have said no mm, definitely that's interesting so i mean if you're just starting out how could you maybe i mean if you're approaching maybe anchor clients because that's kind of what i call them they were a big yeah. name clients so that really helped you to get more big name clients so how can someone like go out there and really approach them like it can feel very intimidated to go to go up to someone like ramit Sethi and i mean do work for him well you know one is um you know most of this is done digitally so i don't feel like you know I, I don't know. I was kind of raised to say, you know, if you want something, just ask and expect people to say no if they don't want. So I just kind of, there's no harm in asking, you know, because it's just one email. They can ignore the email or just reply and say no and, you know, no no problem. Um, it's not like you're like approaching them, you know, on the street or something where it'd be a little more embarrassing. But um, so that's what I think is just start with that. The other is, um, and again, I'm going to give you a quick overview, but you know, read Recession Proof Graduate. It's really good. And you just basically mm -hmm. identify some things that you think you can help them do. So you don't want to just approach people and say, hey, if you need anything, you know, you sh I'll do it for free. The real value is not in getting the work done. It's knowing what needs to be done. You know, if um, it's kind of like, you know, if you if you're having tr trouble, you know, with your toilet and you want to hire a plumber, you know, the value isn't in the fact that he's going to glue these two pipes together. I know how to gl glue pipes together. His value is in he can come in and quickly identify the problem. So that's where you show your value is you um, 
you know, you look for those anchor clients, whoever they are and whatever kind of work you're doing, and you try to identify a problem and say that I can help you fix it. And just by identifying the problem, you're showing your actual value because that's what they need. They need to be able to see things that they don't know how to see. Um, and this can apply to all kinds of industries. I actually coached a local guy um, he was starting a business that was doing hood cleanings for restaurants. You know, um, above the stoves, there's these hoods, and they build up grease, and they become a fire hazard. So it's actually a law in America that they have to be cleaned on a regular basis. But I'm like, if you just went in, offered to show them your equipment, show them how you go about the cleaning in a very environmental way, and then also just point out a couple of things they could be doing different to like lower their liability or like um, or like safety issues, I was like, you're going to show so much value to them just by you know spending one hour in their restaurant that they're not only going to hire you for that, they're going to tell all their friends to be a part of it. And so I really think this works in many many different industries of just helping people identify problems they don't even know they have, and then you can off also offer the solution. Hmm. Yeah, definitely. I completely agree. And that's also comes in a little bit with the book later when you're actually building relationships with maybe influencers in your field. So you can leverage that when you're about to launch your book. But for, before we get into all of this, I mean, I have a lot of people that ask, why should I write a book in the first place? And I talked recently about premium positioning on the show. And I kind of like that concept of how can you position yourself as an expert? I mean, eventually to charge those premium prices. So I wanted to hear maybe your take on this through the standpoint of writing your own book. So a book, you know, it, it does have this special power of positioning you and and putting you up as the expert. Um, and I've seen this myself. You know, I've been working with authors now full time for four and a half years. And my book came out just a year ago. And I've seen more growth in the last year than I did the whole three and a half years prior to that. And the three and a half years prior to that, I had worked with Dan Pink. I had worked with Pam Slim and Ramit and all these big names. But it, it was until a book came out that it started to really put me on a different level and books do that you know I'm still even as somebody that works in publishing that has my own book I still get surprised how much power can be in the fact that I'm not just Tim Grawl that started some consulting company I'm Tim Grawl the author of this book you know that changes things and mm -hmm. just like little things like my my um, inquiries for new work went through the roof to the point where we had to stop taking new clients. Um, and, you know, prior to this, I had been invited to one conference to speak. And ever since my book came out, I've now gone up to six different conferences, including the Writers Digest Conference in South by Southwest. Oh. And so, you know, I, you know, and again, that's because I have a book. There's a different thing around the author. But you have to go into it not thinking, oh, I'm going to sell a ton of copies of my book and make a lot of money. You know, I've sold, I'm bumping against about 10,000 copies of my book sold. And, but altogether, that's made me probably, I think, $20,000. I'd have to go back and look. You know, not, you know, not no money, but, you know, I can't live on $20,000 a year. But being the guy that wrote the book has made me over six figures in the last year. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's where, you know, you don't look at the book. You know, a lot of people think, well, why, why write a book? You know, it's not going to make me a lot of money. And it's like, well, true, you know, just the book itself is not going to make you money. But being the person that wrote that book, that you can leverage into making a lot of money. Mm, definitely makes a lot of sense. And I mean, especially positioning yourself, maybe if you are starting out in a field to maybe research a topic and write about this can really position yourself. And as you said, you got more speaking engagements. I saw you were on Creative Live too, which is, I mean, very like high, high profile to be on there. Like a lot of great names have been there. So it's nice to be seen there around those people as well for you. So that was that was that. And also kind of when you before you launched the book, even in the first place, it's like building up this audience. Can you tell us a bit about your process before you launched your book? You didn't have a large email list in the first place. Yeah, so when I launched the book, I had about 1,800 people on the list, and um, that allowed me, you know, my goal, my goal with the book was I needed to sell at least 1,000 copies because <laughs> that was the book. Yeah. So... Uh, my list of 1,800, and I only promote it to my list. You know, one of the things I try to do is use myself as an experiment. 
So I didn't go out to like my famous clients and try to get them to promote the book. I pretty much just released the book to my own um, my own fan base, and just with 1,800 people, I was able to sell 1,000 copies uh, in two weeks. And so, and then what I've done is a lot of people think like, okay, I have to build this you know giant base of fans, and then I can launch a book and it will be successful. But I actually kind of take a different approach to that. I look at just like we were talking about, I look at the book as the way to build my audience. Mm. So I sold that thousand copies to my fan base, but then you know now almost a year later, I'm at almost ten thousand copies, and that's because I use the book to promote myself. So now um, I can go to podcasts that have you know big followings, and I can say, hey, you know, have me on your show. I'm the author of this book, and I get more inquiries. You know, you reached out to me to do this interview. You know, I'm getting more of those because of the book. And so I've used the book to grow my platform where now I have over 7,500 authors on my list. And when I come out with my next book, um, I'm probably going to have closer to 10,000 and I can make it even more successful. Mm -hmm. So um, so then I can do a big launch with my second book. But with the first book, it's a lot more about using the book to build my platform because this is a long game. You know, I'm not just trying to write this book to make a bunch of money this year. I'm trying to build a platform that's going to support my entire career. And so that's what I look at books to do is it, it's, it's this thing that will help you build your platform um, long into the future. Mm, definitely. We can get into that as well. But what what's, what's some mistakes? You've been working with a lot of authors. Uh, I don't know. Now you're also working with first-time authors, I guess, since you recently launched a program. But what's some mistakes you, have you seen when they are publishing and marketing their first book? So um, there's, you know, there's kind of lots of common mistakes. The first one is just not thinking about marketing from the beginning. Um, you know, there's still that kind of mentality. That, you know, two mentalities I see a lot are one is, well, if I get a traditional publishing contract with a traditional publisher, they're going to take care of all the marketing, and that's just not true. You know, no matter who you are, no matter what kind of publisher, unless you are already an established author like Stephen King or something, you know, all of the marketing is going to fall on you. So that's the first thing is they're not thinking about marketing. They think somebody else is going to take uh, take care of it. And then they don't start thinking about the marketing until maybe three or four or six months before the book comes out. And at that point, it's a little too late. And so I'm looking at, well, how can I build a platform so that the book comes out of the platform and everybody that I've you know, have followed me for all these years are now going to buy the book. You know, so I'm always thinking about marketing. I'm always thinking about how can I build my platform bigger so that when I release something, whether it's a book or something else, it's going to be more successful. Um, so that's the first thing. The second thing is getting really kind of strung out on all of these tools out there. You know, there's, you know, Twitter and Facebook and Google mm -hmm. Plus and LinkedIn podcasting and blogging and Pinterest and, you know, like a, a hundred different things you can be doing to promote your book. And, um, they all have their place, but you also can't do all of them well. And so I usually am like, you know, pick three things that you can do really well. And if you do those three things really well, it'll be way better than just spreading yourself thin across every platform out there. And so, you know, you have to start with building an email list. That's the most important thing. But then from there, just find something that works and just stick with it long enough to be successful. You know, for me, it's like I have my emails that I send out every week, and I put a blog post up every week, and I basically try to do as many interviews as I can. You know, those three things have worked. And, like, if I do that month after month after month, it grows and becomes successful. But if I was trying to constantly put stuff on Facebook and keep my Twitter up to, you know, and build my followings on those at the same time that I'm doing Google Plus Hangouts, at the same time I'm trying to build a forum, at the same time I'm trying to do a podcast, you know, like all of it would suck. And that's what I see is everybody's kind of just spreading themselves so thin that they're not doing any of it well. Mm -hmm. And so forget this advice that says every author needs to be on Twitter or every author should be writing you know, a blog and find three things that can work really well for you and just stick with them and do them great and that's how you build yeah definitely and that's what I kind of found in your book as well you're all about the plan you know planning out this process before you even start writing or writing your book you need to have a marketing plan kind of so can you talk about this as well like you have kind of a systems based approach to all of this 
Yeah, so a couple of fundamental things I try to do is um, make sure I'm tracking things and and being willing, you know, everything is on the table. You know, I will try anything that's not unethical or immoral um, or illegal to try to sell books. It's all on the table. But I also quickly push things off the table that don't work. So I don't have, like, sacred cows that I'm going to do this whether it works or not. You know, I am interested in whatever works. And so a lot of people, again, I, you know, I, I'm always – I'm always flagging on Twitter. Like Twitter doesn't sell books. And I see all of these authors trying to build this huge following on Twitter. And then when they try to sell books and it doesn't work, they just keep doing it thinking, well, I'm wrong. And it's like, no, it just doesn't work. Find something else that actually works. So that's the first thing. And then, yes, I try to step back and come up with an overarching plan because all of these things we've talked about, the social media tools, blogging, even an email list, they're just tools in a toolbox. They are not the point, you know, and it's like so many people just try – it's like trying to build a house before you have a blueprint and before you have, really have a plan and just like grabbing a hammer and some nails and hammer and boards together and thinking it might turn into something beautiful. No, you start with a plan, and then once you know what you're trying to build, you can reach in your toolbox and grab the right tool, and this is the same way. You know, every author needs to have permission to contact their audience. They need to be putting content out into the world, and they need to be doing outreach so more people know they exist. And you have to do those three things. And what's nice is there's lots of different ways to do those three things. Mm -hmm. But you plan it out, reach in your toolbox, grab the right tool, and then if that tool's not working, throw it away and pick up something else. You know, so I try to be systematic about trying something new and try to be systematic about testing to actually see if it works. So, like, actually, right now, I'm running a new Facebook ads campaign, and I'm I'm doing this, but I'm not just throwing my money down the hole. I'm actually – I've read a lot on it. I've figured out what I think might work. Now I'm putting it in, and I'm actually testing on the back end to see if it actually sells anything. If it doesn't sell anything – I either need to throw it out or try something new, not just keep trying the same thing over and over. So that's, you know, that's the kind of thing is like I'm in this for the long haul. I'm going to try new things. I want to stay on the edge of what's working and what's not. But I'm also not just going to follow the masses because they say, oh, everybody should be doing this when I see clearly it's not working. Hmm. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's we are all in this for the long run. It's not a sprint. Essentially, it's like a marathon. And I mean, is this what you call like, yeah, you talked about permission, content, outreach, and then you track, and you always sell and you track everything. But is that what you call the kind of the connection system that you have, like throw it together, all of this? Yeah, so, you know, that's the that's kind of what the book is based on is the connection system. And that's the three pieces, you know, permission, which is the ability to communicate with people that gets their attention and drives action. And that's where you need an email list. That's the most consistent way to communicate with people and get their attention. Um, and then you need content. You actually need to be putting content out into the world freely and widely. You know, that's blog posts, it's podcasts, that's all kinds of stuff. But you need people to be able to engage with your content to see if you're even a good fit for them. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, you need reach. You need a way to move people from not knowing you exist to knowing you exist. You know, I get emails from people on a regular basis that are like, you know, I have my website up, I've got my email list signed up, and I'm putting up a new blog post every week, but nothing's working. What's going on? Should I blog more? And I'm like, no, 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 no. Nobody knows you exist. You have to go out and introduce yourself to new mm-hmm. people. And again, there's a lot of different ways to do that. Um, but what I've seen is if an author solves each of those three problems, if they're moving people from not knowing they exist, knowing they exist, they're giving them some content to engage with to know if they're a good fit for them, and then inviting them to be on their email list so they can stay in contact long term, that's what naturally leads to long term book sales, more you know, and it you know, I talk about books a lot, but it works for anything. You know, you'll get more um inquiries for new work, you'll get uh if you products, you'll get more product sales, you'll have that direct connection to people. Mm. So that the connection system and that that's kind of my blueprint you know every author i look at you know any of my entrepreneur friends that are trying to start an online business you know those are the three things i look at you have to solve each of those three problems and then you're able to sell something but you know so many people start with a product and they don't do that first or they're you know i've talked to a guy um 
last year and he speaks like 60 times a year all over the world you know all you know each year he speaks to tens of thousands of people well now he's got a book coming out and he's like he's like you know for years i've been speaking to tens of thousands of people every year and now that i have something to sell i have no way to contact them to let them mm. know so he had solved his outreach problem tons probably hundreds of thousands of people know he exists mm. but he has no contact them to let him know that let them know something new is out yeah. and so that's why you have each of those three pieces solved yeah i mean if we i mean if we want to write our our book and build up this interest list for it maybe we don't have an audience in the first place when we are starting out uh, should we what should we do should we put up like a maybe a landing page for the book and then maybe hey, I mean, drive interest to that or what what would you recommend yeah so i would say um you know, the first thing you want to do is have some sort of web presence. And it's important to remember, you don't, it doesn't have to be perfect. It can be a free WordPress.com blog, like mm -hmm. you, but you do need a web presence. So if people Google you or if you give out your URL, they can actually find you. And then you want the main call to action. The main thing you're asking people to do on that page is sign up for your email list. You know, you want to invite them by saying, you know, get a free chapter of my book or download my new white paper or whatever it is. You want to get them on the email list, and then once you have that in place, you've kind of built your bucket. You know that you you built something to catch people, um, and then now your job is to just pour people in. You need to go out and find find ways to get people to go to your site and sign up for that email list. You know, and that's what a lot of this is for me. You know, I'm on this show. It's I'm moving. Um, everybody watching this, or most of the people watching this, they didn't know I existed before this, and now they do. And then I always you. Know, talk about how I have an email list and I do this free 30-day course if you sign yeah. up. And so it's, again, moving people down that path to giving me permission. Mm -hmm. and so that, that's what you go out. Once you have that bucket, once you have that, you know, sign up for my email list, now you just need more people to know and more people to come to your website. Mm -hmm. And how do you keep in contact with them during this time? Maybe your book is three or four months out and you want to put this page up and do you, do you like interact with them and keep them updated on the book process or what would you do in this, this pro process? So if I back up and look at just the idea of what marketing is, um, you know, if you go to like dictionary.com and look up the yeah. word market, the, the definition is mostly useless. Yeah. Um, so my, my definition of marketing is first, create long-lasting connections with people. And that's what we talked about. Get them on an email list so that you can stay in contact with them long-term. So create long-lasting connections with people. And the second is be relentlessly helpful. It's constantly look for ways to add value to their lives. So that's what I try to do with my email list is every week I send out something and I try to make it something helpful. A, a, a long blog post talking about how to set up an author website or how to deal with criticism or something I'm learning. It usually comes from something I'm learning. You know, and a lot of times people kind of get like tied up in their head of like, you know, you know, what do I write and how do I write and how do I go about this? And like the a couple things that have helped me a lot. The first is Make sure you know who you're writing for. You know, year, year, years ago when I, I, you know, everything I talk about, I've dealt with myself. So, you know, years ago, I was always like tied up in my head about like what to write and who to write for. And like, you know, I don't know as much as this person over here. So why should anybody listen to me? And one day I got off the phone with a client and she was like the perfect person that I'm trying to help. You know, she's just in this place where she doesn't know what to do. All of this marketing is overwhelming. You know, what should she do? We had this hour-long phone call, and I just helped her out a lot. I'm like, that's who I'm trying to help. And so I actually um, printed out a picture of her, cut it out, and like taped it on the wall next to my monitor. And every time I wrote an email to my email list, I just acted like I was writing an email to mm -hmm. her. And I'm like, something I could write today to be helpful to her. And that kind of helped me get over it. And then what I do now is I keep a running list of questions that people email me, and I usually turn those into blog posts. So if I come up on a week and I'm not sure what to write about this week, I open up my little Evernote file where I have all of these questions that have come in, and I just pick one, and I write a long email. And again, I think you know, if I was standing in front of a person at some conference and they said, you know, how do, how do you deal with criticism? you know, what advice would I give them? And I just type that out, organize it as a blog post, and that's my blog post for the week. So I really try to be practical about these things. I try to keep it simple, and I try to remember that, like, 
Yes, I have 7,500 people on my email list, but there's 7,500 individual people. You know, it's so when they get an email, they're getting an email from Tim to their inbox. And so I try to write something that I think is going to be helpful for those people. And I find if I kind of focus on like one person instead of, you know, however many people, um, it makes it much simpler to just give advice and share what's on my mind and share what I think will be helpful. And it sounds like you're very clear over your avatar, or some people likes to call it. And like you're writing actually for one person, one specific person. It makes it so much easier than writing for 7,500, right? So I think that's, that's a big thing as well. Yeah, and I had somebody um, ask me the other day. They're like, they're like, you know, I, I, I wrote this email and I kind of poured out my soul into this email and I had like 10 people unsubscribe. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, I had... 50 unsubscribed the other day like that's a hey that's part of it because when you're writing for a specific audience there are pe most people in the world are not going to fit into that and so you can't worry about them you know i write for authors the vast majority of the people on this planet are not authors and so they should be on my list and so don't think about like you know i'm trying to write something so that if anybody comes along it'll be perfect for them Hmm. It's like, no, 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 no. This is who I'm trying to help. These are the types I'm trying to help. I'm going to write for them, and I'm going to let everybody else self-select out of being on my list. You know, I had somebody email me and was like, you know, um, I don't want this stuff anymore. You know, why are you sending me this stuff? And I'm like, well, you signed up, and every email I send has a little unsubscribe. Me. Just click it. You know, you won't hurt my feelings. Just go on with your life. Not a good fit for each other. Hmm. Um so, and I found like the more that I focus on helping a specific type of people, the more those people become bigger fans of me and the more the people that shouldn't be a part of what I'm doing self-select out. And, you know, they weren't ever going to like hire me or buy anything anyway. So what's the point of trying to keep them around? I want fans. You know, I want people that are active participants in what I'm doing, not just passive observers. Mm. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it sounds as well like you're you're writing emails. You have you're getting in, get, getting in questions, and then you can also write blog posts about this, and that kind of comes into as well. Then later with the outreach, how you're finding those actually the audience, and how did you do that when you launched your book? Because you didn't have a big platform, so did you go out and guest post it, or what did you do? Um, I did some guest posting. One of the things I focused on early on that, that worked really well is I kind of did a bunch of podcasts. Um, I met um, I met a girl at, uh, at a conference last year that runs a podcast, and she introduced me to a bunch of her podcaster friends, and I just w did that. And I kind of did – there's not a lot of, like, writing-specific podcasts that have big audiences, but – so I just kind of went a different direction. You know, I've started my own business. I'm an entrepreneur. There's a lot of entrepreneurial podcasts. And so I just started reaching out to them and saying, hey, I'm the author of this book. I started my own business. You should have me on as a guest. And I just started doing that. And those really helped. Um, I also, you know, I also write a lot of, like I mentioned, blog posts and emails, and those get shared. Mm. So people share um, their friends and authors and social media, and that brings in new people. Um, I've done webinars for different people and that brings in new people. I kind of just do, you know, again, I try to take my own advice. So I don't have any one way I try to do it. I just look at it as what is an opportunity to move people from not knowing I exist to knowing I exist. And if it seems like a decent opportunity, I'll give it a try. Mm -hmm. And so I don't have any one thing I do. I'm just constantly looking for opportunities to do that. Definitely. But one, before we get in kind of to how you do this with the outreach, I want to ask, uh, like, if you're an author and like pro ha writing blog posts and all this, how much should you actually give away for free? Maybe you have some chapters in your book or I mean, I, I recently interviewed Joe Polizzi. He said like 75 percent of his book is actually like out for free online. Yeah. And a lot of what I've talked about in the book is, is online as well. You know, um, I get that question a lot. Um, you know what? You know what if I give too much away, or how much should I give away? And it's like, you know, here's the thing: you're you're focusing on the wrong fear. You should be afraid, but not of giving away too much stuff. Of coming out with a book and nobody knows you exist. 
Like that's what you should actually be afraid of. And the fastest way to to get your name out there is to share lots and lots and lots of content. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I had a guy yesterday email me and he's like, you know what, I, I want to buy 20 copies of your digital book to give away to friends, but it's really hard to do that on Kindle. I can only like do it one at a time. And I was like, well, how about you just pay me for 20 copies and I'll just send you the digital file and you send it to them. He's like, yeah, but then they could share it and, and they'll get pirated. I'm like, if somebody wants to pirate my book and read a book on book marketing, like they're a big fan, that's fine. At least they know I exist. You know, before they didn't even know I existed, so that's fine. And so I am always interested in like how can I move people from not knowing I exist to knowing I exist and focusing first on that and the best way to do that is to put content out in the world. And so I pretty much put out all of it. In fact, um, I'm, I'm working. I'm just starting work on a new book, and my plan is like by the time the book comes out, pretty much everything is going to be out in the world already, um, because that's how I'm going to bring people in and want to be a part of what I'm doing. And really, there's a lot of value in having it as a bound one narrative that walks you through. So even if it's all out there in podcast episodes and blog posts and everything else, it's really hard to get through. And for, you know, 10 bucks, you can get a book and get it all in one place. You know, I buy books from authors that I know probably half of what they've already written, but having a book form of it that I can refer to and have notes in, there's a lot of value in that. So I always skew hard towards share, 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 put more and more and more out there because that's going to build the audience. And once they trust you with that, they're going to buy whatever you come out with. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it builds your it builds your brand as well, like as you as you move forward. And it's the same with kind of free eBooks online, like they, it's perceived as a higher value if you maybe bundle up a blog post. And I mean, if you do that with your book, you can do the same thing with online courses, like it's the convenience people pay for essentially online. So I mean, I completely agree with that. If you move on a little bit with the outreach, something I, I mean, I'm fascinated about this as well, since when I do, I do a lot of like expert roundup post. I'm trying to get other people involved in my content, reaching out to them. So what's your strategy when it comes to outreach, especially when it comes to book marketing? So the first thing you have to do with outreach is make sure you have the right attitude about it. So, so many people like get caught up in like, okay, I got to sell my book. So I'm going to go out and pitch these people on promoting my book. And it's like, it just doesn't work well. You, you have to start by saying, okay, how can I help them get what they want out of life? So like one of the things I've, I, I've said over and over, and I don't know why more authors don't do it when they're getting started, is like if you want to connect with an author, review their book on your blog. You know, if you put up a review on your blog that says, this is a great book, you should buy it, I really enjoyed it, and then you reach out to that author and say, hey, you know, I just wanted to let you know I promoted your book over here, like, you started by helping them. And so what kind of relationship are you going to have long term if you started by looking for ways to help them? You know, you can't get into the quid pro quo like, oh, I did a review, so they better do a review of my book too, like, work. But I just start out by saying, well, how can I help other people get what they want out of life, knowing that over the long term, I'm going to have lots of people that want to help me too. And so that's the first thing I do is just start by like, how can I find people that I can help them with what they want to do? Um, in fact, just the other day, I was helping an author, just kind of a, an indie novelist um, with some advice on things just for free, like helping them out. And um, and now he's going to send out a promotion for my book to his entire list. And I didn't even ask him. He's like, hey, I'm going to do this for you because I love your book and I really appreciate your help. You know, so a lot of times my outreach doesn't even look like outreach. It doesn't look like I'm going out and trying to get somebody to promote something. I, but I am trying to build relationships because back to my definition of marketing – I'm trying to create long-lasting connections. I want a connection with somebody that doesn't just help me promote my book now, but helps me long into the future because I'm helping them as well. Um, and that's where, like, if you circle back around where I talked about, you know, being, you know, going out to pile. 
podcast that's actually being helpful to them. Every podcast needs guests for their show. And so I feel like I could be a good guest. I come on. I'm a guest on their show. I'm not there to pitch anything. I just share as much information as I possibly can during the interview. And then so they get what they need out of life, which is great content and great guests for their shows. I get what I want is a lot of people now know I exist that didn't know I exist. It's a big win-win. But I start with how can I help them get what they want out of life? If I can do that, it's going to come back to me. You know, If I do that for 20 people, not all 20 of them are going to help me, but 15 of them will, and they'll do it because they want to, not because I talked them into it. Mm-hmm. So that's really what I look at is I look at I look out into the world and I look at like, okay, who would be a good fit for me to do some kind of promotion with? And then I don't – my next question is not how can I get them to promote me. It's how can I help them? And the other thing that I think a lot of um, people make mistakes with is they shoot for the A-list, okay? So you know, if I'm like a C-list author, I go out to like the top author in the world and try to get them to promote something or do something together. And that's a big mistake, not just because, like, you know, you're so different. Like, why should they help you? You're not going to be able to help them as much. But the the thing is, is, like, a lot of times we think, well, everybody's getting a lot of requests. 90, I would, you know, I don't have data to back this up, but I would guess 80 to 90% of people are going to those A-list authors asking them for everything. I work for those authors. I know how many asks they get on a daily basis. Mm-hmm. So if I'm a list author, I shouldn't go for the A-list because they're getting hammered with ask all the time, and I can't really offer them anyway. I should go to those B-list authors because they're not getting asked for stuff every day, and I'm much more in a position to actually help them as much as they help me. And then what happens is, is as we both grow, when I become a B-list author, I'm now friends with a bunch of A-list authors Mm because they've grown as well. So I'm always looking at not how can I like jump up and get these big time authors to promote what I'm doing. I'm like, okay, what are authors kind of near me at my level or a little higher? I can kind of help them, and then they're going to be much more likely to help me because they don't have a hundred people asking them every day. Mm. So other mistake is we we tend to want like these big time people to promote us we want to be on the biggest blogs and we want to be promoted by the biggest authors and we want the best known author to put their blurb on the cover of our book and it just doesn't work well but if you can kind of partner with these authors that are still up and coming and you get a lot of them kind of in your corner because you've been helping them you've been building relationships you'll all grow together and then you'll look around and be one day like, look, I got like some of the biggest authors, you know, known as my friends. And it's not because I got one little blurb from them one time. It's because we've become friends and we help each other with everything now. And again, that's that long term view. It's not about trying to sell an extra hundred copies today. It's about wanting to be able to sell tens of thousands of copies down the road. Yeah, I mean, this is extremely valuable. I think, I mean, that's actually a lot of people, they make this mistake. They want to be featured on the biggest blog and they just started out. And the same with the people they reach out to. So I wanted to ask you, like, is there a specific way to kind of reach out to someone? Maybe if someone would reach out to you, what's a great way to actually reach out to you and tell tell you that maybe they reviewed your book or they, I mean, they did something, you know, they want they, they want to actually become become on your radar essentially well the first thing and you know i'll probably sound like a jackass for saying this but i work with so many like well-known people that won't be honest and um like just not in a bad way they just don't want to be mean so let me tell you honestly how to go about it if you want me to pay attention to you the best way to do it is to do something for me first to come to me and say, look, I've done this. You know, if, if an author comes to me and was like, you know what, I bought a copy of your book for everybody in my writer's group. Even if it's just five people, I'm going to be like, thank you so much. Like That's how my book spreads is one person getting five people to read it. And if they have a favor, I'm much more likely to look positively on that favor. So that's the first thing. And, that's, and again, I preach that not just because coming to me, but because – that's how people want to be approached, and that's how I've been successful. So, um, so start by looking for ways to help them. A secondary thing would be make their life easy. 
make it really, really easy to promote your stuff. So um, let me give an example. So a couple years ago, I was working with this author on their book launch, and I identified this blogger, and I really, really wanted this blogger to promote my author's book. So um, here's what most people do. Here's what like most publicists do is they have like a canned email talking about how great the book is and, hey, can we do something? together you know and they send it out to everybody and of course most people don't respond and so this is how I went about it. I went to the guy's blog the bloggers uh, the bloggers blog and I and I just read through quickly scanned through the last like three months worth of posts and I just read through them got a sense for um, you know what he writes about and what I noticed was every time he promoted a book he liked to do a Skype interview just like this with the author and so whenever he promoted a book, there would always be a, a video embed of an interview with the author. And so I shot him an email, and I was like – and I did a couple things. I was like, first, you know, I like your blog. I think it's great. Second, my author has a book coming out that's perfect for your audience. You write about this stuff. He also writes about this stuff. So it's a good overlap. And third, I see that you do Skype interviews, and we would love to do a Skype interview with you. You just let us know what works for you. And so I made sure he knew my content overlapped with his content and was a good fit for his audience, and I did my research to find out how he normally promotes authors, and the author immediately wrote me back and gave me a yes. And it was because I did a little bit of research and made it really easy for him to say yes because I'm like, I'm going to package what I do to exactly fit what you already do. So like if somebody comes to me and they're like, hey, will you do a blog post review of my online course? And it's like if you look through any of my blog posts, I have never promoted anything. So don't ask me to promote something on my blog. But if you've been on my email list, you'll see that every once in a while I'll promote something from a friend of mine that's a good fit for my audience. So what you need to do is come to me and say, look, this is a great fit for you. I think that um, you would, your audience would get a lot out of it for these reasons, and I would love if you just put a little blurb in one of your newsletters. That makes it really easy for me to just write back and say, yep, write up the blurb. I'll drop it in. And it shows that you've actually done your research instead of like I'm just on a list of 100 people you're blasting the same email to. So you know, do your research and just have empathy. Like, Put yourself in the other person's shoes and think, well, what can I do to make their life easier? You know, If they regularly have guest posts on their blog, pitch them on a guest post because they need more guest posts. If they regularly have you know, people on their podcast, pitch doing that. If they, you know, whatever they do, mold what you do to fit that so it makes it an easy yes, so it makes their life easy. Mm, definitely. I think – Definitely the research is important, like especially if you are maybe if you're interviewing someone, it's good to actually have have some knowledge of what they are about unless you are doing a very like scripted show, whatever. But, you know, I mean, for this show, for example, Lifestyle Architects, I, I, I know about the people I bring on here because I really want them on my show. I'm interested in their work. Like otherwise, you know, you wouldn't be on here. So I think that re that is really important. A lot of people miss this kind of research and they just want everybody attention but you know if you go one by one that's even more powerful i think yeah and again um people think that so there's people get confused on what a shortcut is so people tend to think a shortcut means oh i can just turn this stuff out and i'm just going to jump to the top and it's like no, no 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 there are shortcuts but shortcuts are really just doing it right you know what i just described you takes like 10 times as long to do one outreach email as just turning them out, but it actually is a shortcut because in the long run, it gets you way more yeses. So it doesn't seem like a shortcut. It seems like, well, this guy's telling me to do something that just take me forever, but it actually works where the other stuff doesn't work. And so, you know, looking at it as like, I'm again, back to what we've already talked about. I'm in this for the long term. I'm trying to create long-term relationships. Long-term relationships are not created by me trying to convince somebody to promote my stuff. It's by me trying to help them get what they want out of life. And so that's where you have to start. Yeah, and then eventually you can utilize those maybe influencer relationships you've built up to spread the word of your book when it comes out or whatever reason because you're already friends with them. Right, and because you've helped them, they're going to want to help you too. Like just yesterday, 
I sent out a promotion to my email list, and one of my big clients, who, who I didn't even know was on my email list, he took it, put it on on uh, to all of his followers without me even realizing it. And uh, the only reason I realized it is somebody sent it to me. And so I was like, you know, that's the kind of relationships I want to create. Is they just because I've tried to be a part of what they're doing, they want to be a part of what I'm doing too because we both want each other to succeed. And so I will promote them and they promote me, not because of quid, quid pro quo or that I even ask. It's like, well, they like what I'm doing. They, they respect it and they want to be a part of it. And I'd rather have 10 of those relationships than 100 of people that I just cajoled into doing something for me once because those 10 people are in my corner and they're going to help me for the rest of my career. Mm, definitely. I want to get back to, I mean, the title of your book is your first thousand copies. And I mean, thousand books sold. It's, uh, I mean, what, what's the average uh, average of the books being sold? It's like 250 copies. I think I read that. I, I don't know if you, it was in your book, but, but uh, I mean, thousand copies, that can be a big goal when you're just starting out. But I mean, you, you say it's very attainable as well. So can you talk about that a bit and how maybe someone can reach this goal? Yeah, so um, most books sell about 250 copies or less. That's traditional published books too, you know. Um, and so, and if you think about it, like most of us have enough people in our life that we can get close to 200 copies, you know, mm -hmm. if you think about who you work with, if you can convince your mom to buy a copy, you know, like, you know, if you can get kind of just your network of people to buy a copy of the book, you can usually get close to 200, 250 on your own. So that thousand book number is interesting because if you're able to sell a thousand copies, you've convinced about 750 people that don't know you personally to lay down money and buy a copy of your book. And once you've done that, once you've reached a thousand copies, it's much easier to go from a thousand copies to two thousand copies than it is from zero to a thousand. And so that's why I picked that thousand copy name, um, that thousand copy goal, because if you figure out how to do that, you figured out how to get people to buy your book that aren't directly like, for, like you don't know them personally, and it's much easier to repeat that process to keep selling the book. Um, and so, but I've kind of laid out, you know, um, definitely. You can get, and one you know, thing I wanted to get to, one thing I wanted to get to before we move on is like is. I mean, you're not in this for the, like, I mean, you told me you're in this for the long run, but the first week of the book, is that important maybe for, for it to become a bestseller or what, what's your approach to this thing, especially on Amazon, I would, I would say. So, um, it depends on your goals and, you know, this can be a big topic. And, uh, if you just Google, um, my name and like bestseller list must die, you'll mm -hmm. find this a long article I wrote on Hugh Howey's blog uh, about okay. what goes in. I will link it up in the show notes as well over at navid.me slash 36. So I'll put it in there as well. Okay, perfect. So um, if, you, if you're curious about how like the big best-selling bestseller list work, that's kind of where I wrote it up. Um, as far as how the Amazon bestseller works, it's much more like if you sell a bunch of copies in a short window of time, you'll spike in ranking. Um, so... Um, it can be important to, yeah, you know, when a book first comes out, you want to sell a lot of copies. You want to have that big push. Your rankings go high. Um, lots of people buy the book at the same time, which means they're telling people about it. Um, you know, and, you know, everybody that buys your book is somebody that's going to potentially tell somebody else to buy your book. So, yeah, it's important to do a big push in the beginning to get all of the people connected to you to go ahead and buy a copy. And that's really, really important. Um, so, but what I what I want to encourage people is like it doesn't actually matter that much long term. So, um, so again, I sold a thousand copies in the first two weeks, but now I'm about to hit ten thousand copies, and that's because I just keep promoting the book year after year or month after month. And you know, Dan Pink, I did an interview with him a while back, and he talked about he's like every time I come out with a book, that's the next two years of my life. Hmm. You know. You know, when his book, his last book to sell, Human, launched, it went to number one on the New York Times bestseller list. But he didn't stop. He keeps promoting it, keeps promoting it, keeps promoting it, and that's how he sells hundreds of thousands of copies. Where other people that hit the bestseller list still only sell to twenty thousand copies because they hit it, they completely stop, and that's all their book ever does. 
And so, yes, it's important to do, a, if you have a platform, do a big push, sell a bunch of books right at the, out of the gate, but that's not it. You have to keep going, keep going, keep going. Definitely, but you, you use your email list, own, basically only your email list and like some outreach on podcasts to kind of launch your book. You had 1,800, now you grew, grew it over the last year, obviously, but uh, um, is that the way to do go about it? Like like pushing it to your email list. How much can you push it to the email list? Should you like send out a bunch of emails, or what's the approach there? I actually sent out nine emails to my list to promote it, which is way more than what most people are comfortable with. But I found a couple things. One is with with all but like two of those emails. I sent out content with it. Like I, I tried to make the emails stand alone as helpful while also using them to promote the book. Mm -hmm. So I would say, you know, here's, a, here's a portion of my book I think you'll find really helpful. I'd share that portion of the book. And then I'd also say, you know, this is part of the book. You should pick up a copy to read the whole thing. So I found that, the, that people will stay with you. They'll open lots of emails. They won't unsubscribe as long as you're trying to be helpful, as long as you're sending good content. But I am also not shy about promoting my work. You know, I truly believe I've written one of the best books on book marketing that's out there mm -hmm. and that the more authors that buy my book can read it, the better off they're going to be. So I'm not shy in asking them to buy a copy of the book because they're going to be better off if they do. Um, so I, I send lots of emails. Um, I try to put lots of good content out in them, but I also am not shy about asking people to buy a copy of the book because, you know, one, like I said, it's going to be helpful to them. Two, I run a business, and if people don't buy my books, I'm going to go out of business, and then I can't help anybody. Definitely. And so um, – I try to, and if people, and people do get annoyed when I try to get them to buy something, mm -hmm. but that's okay. They can unsubscribe and go get free stuff somewhere else. You know, I'm going to give a lot of, you know, I try to, you know, probably 95% of the content I put out is just free content, no strings attached. And then the other 5%, I try to promote some products. That's how I stay in business. And yeah, definitely. And you're not trying to cater to everyone either. You know, we are, I mean, the people who really want our stuff, they will still buy it, you know, it's with your book and, you know, a lot of other people with online courses, you know, they have their certain percentage that buy their stuff and they will still buy it. So, but you didn't use any other platforms such as social media to promote it, or did you build that up too? What's a great way to promote it there? You have your email list and then you have maybe your social media outlets like Twitter and Facebook. Is there a way to promote there in a great way? I mostly ignore social media. Um, so what I found is, um, so I'll, I'll try to go, you know, I can go real deep on like why it doesn't work, <laughs> best way to go about it. Um, I have an article about that too that you can post in the show notes. Definitely. Um, that, um, so here's the thing about social media is, like I said, it, it, it doesn't convert very well. And it's because of the way people interact with it. So let's just take Twitter, for example. So um, are you active on Twitter? Yeah, I'm quite active. Yeah, I mean, I mostly interact with people like influencers and my friends on there, too. I mean, I provide value to them. That's what I do. Well, so how many people do you follow on Twitter like that you've actually followed on Twitter about? I mean, I have probably around 3,000 people I, I follow there, but who I pay attention to, that's probably way less. That's right. So of all those updates from those 3,000 people that come through in a 24-hour period, how many of those do you actually read? Less than 1%? Yeah, I would say so, yeah. Now, look at your email inbox. How many emails do you get that you at least look at? Out of the 100% of emails, what, probably 90 95%? Yeah, pro of probably something like that, yeah the difference is social media just doesn't have the engagement and here's the other side it's a lot easier to get 10 people with a thousand followers each to promote something of mine than to build my own following of 10,000 people so what I found is I put content out and I make it easy to share on social media but I'm not trying to build my own social media followings. I just encourage people to share it on their social media because that will reach far more people mm -hmm. than I could ever build a following on my own. And as they come in, I get them on my email list because that's how I can stay in contact long term. So like if you look at my Facebook, I'm, I think I 
posted something on Facebook to get something free a couple days ago, but otherwise I haven't posted anything. Um, my Twitter, all I do is basically retweet people that say they like my book. Um, I'm not on Google Plus because I still can't really figure out how to use it. Um, and Instagram, all it is is pictures of my kids. Mm -hmm. So that's social media presence. I have very little presence, and what I've noticed is it does not slow down my growth. In fact, I say not being on it helps me grow because I'm able to focus on the few things that do. If I spent all day trying to promote myself on social media, I wouldn't get my blog posts written. I wouldn't get my emails out. They would be half-assed. And so I focus on the two or three things that work really well and kind of ignore everything else, and it works. Yeah. And um, very little on social media. Um, I just – when I start seeing it work consistently for lots of people, I might step back into it. But I've seen behind the scenes on social media campaigns, and it just does not turn into sales like you think it should. Hmm. Very interesting. And I mean, one thing I've seen from a, a big name, Ramit Sethi, he's, I mean, he has a pretty big following, but he doesn't use it in this way. The only way, he, I mean, he only uses the email list. I'm on his list. I know the way he kind of promotes is an amazing copywriter, obviously, but you know, he's not using Twitter for this and he's not even using Facebook that much for it. You know, he doesn't have the best engagement on his Facebook because it's not there, but his email list, that's another story. And I mean, just wanted to stress this point about the email list. That's kind of why I brought it up in the first place. So people really realize this. And Ramit's a lot smarter than me. So if he's not doing it, take a cue. You know, mm -hmm. that's, it's like if you look at people that are actually making money online, they're not spending a ton of time on social media. Mm. Social media has its uses and it has its benefits. Like I do log in. I have a, a small Facebook group of authors that have purchased my course that I interact with on Facebook on a daily basis. But it's just for that. It's not for all this other crap people try to use it for. Yeah, and then the same with Derek Halpern, you know, he says if you're not building an email list, you're an idiot. So <laughs> that kind of goes into this as well, <laughs> you know, but, you know, you've shared so much amazing content here over the over an hour almost. So where can people find you and like see what you're up to, all the awesome things you're doing? So um, the two best places to find me are outthinkgroup.com, O-U-T-T-H-I-N-K, uh, group.com, or just you know Google my name or anything close to that, and you'll find my website. Sign up for the email list. Um, and then if you want to copy my book, uh, it's, at, it's on Amazon, uh, your first 1,000 copies. Definitely. I'll link up everything in the show notes over at navid.me slash 36. So any final words to my audience here, Tim? You know, the biggest thing is just I know what it feels like to be in the slog and to feel like everything's slow and everything's not working. But if you focus on helping people, building long-term connections, laying that foundation, that's what's going to support everything you do long into the future. So if you're struggling, you feel like it's not working, just stick at it, have those principles, and that's what's going to help you succeed long term. Definitely. Seems to be a very common theme here on the show that you should be in this for the long term. So thanks so much, Tim, for coming on my show and sharing so much valuable information. Thanks. Oh, thanks for having me, Naveed. I, I enjoyed it.